What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder with Ryan Sullivan, and uh, we got ourselves a real special guest on today, uh, representing the Miami Dolphins, uh, BF's Kevin Gerard. Kevin, first of all, thanks for coming on today, and uh, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, guys. I'm good. I'm one and zero, so it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, you you can hold that above us, man. But right now, you guys are leading the division. Um, I mean, I gotta say though, I think I, the AFC East as a whole was really kind of underwhelming on Sunday. I I mean, the fact that uh, no one scored more than 17 points is was kind of honestly something I wasn't expecting. I I knew that Kevin for you guys like you know I thought Miami and New England was definitely going to be a uh, you know a close game, but I actually thought there was going to be some some more points than that. But uh, good win though, I'll give you guys that one for sure. Always a good win on the road at New England. Yeah, it's weird how our mentality has changed. Eh, like a year, even a year ago, any victory in Gillette would have been like, wow, we won. I can't believe it. Now, like Dolphins fans are complaining that we only beat them by a point <laughs> at home, you know, or I should say on the road, you know, in week one, when Belichick had five months to prepare, like it's, it's weird how the expectations have changed. It was like, it's like the bit of that first Bills Patriots game last year, where I, a lot of people wanted to, them to come in and blow, blow them out. And it ended up being the Justin Zimmer thing at the end, which I get. I get wanting to blow him out, but I just I I have such PTSD from Belichick. I don't care if it's a point or a million points. Get me out of Gillette with a win, or get me out of New get me out of a New England game with a win, and I don't care. I don't care how it looks. Yeah, exactly. Right, for sure. But uh, looking at the Bills, though, Ryan, um, you know, Week One didn't go as planned. I guess you could say I a lot of. People were very confident going into this game for the Bills, thought that they could possibly blow out Pittsburgh. And obviously the complete opposite happened. Pittsburgh uh, came from behind, beat the Bills 23-16. What was a pretty sloppy, ugly game. I guess like looking at this game, Ryan, because a lot of people are pressing that panic button, freaking out that the season's over for Buffalo, that they got nothing. You know, this is not a championship team. From what you saw went wrong, what, what to you is the biggest thing that it's something that's correctable that you're confident was sort of a one game thing and will be fine for the rest of the season. So this is a little bit of a cop out answer, but I've seen a couple people say, well, this is the blueprint for being the bills. And it's not the blueprint for being the bills. It's a blueprint for being any team anywhere. You, if you can get pressure with four on, whether it's Tom Brady, whether it's Pat Mahomes, whether it's anyone, if you get pressure with four and you can drop everyone else back, that's, that's the, that's the solution to, to beating any quarterback, no matter how good. Now, it, it, I say it's a cop-out because we can't sit here as a team with Super Bowl aspirations and just say, well, when we get to a team with really good pass rush, we just got to throw our hands up and say, well, that, that's it there, right? We have to – we knew coming into the season that John Feliciano was, was a liability and that that interior offensive line is a liability. And – you know, I, I was a little concerned just by the lack of any sort of adjustment throughout the game. You know, I think, it. you know, if you're going to roster a guy like, you know, if you're not going to play Zach Moss, who's the superior back in press protection, throw Reggie Gillian back there, throw, bring an extra lineman in and put, maybe throw out a couple of mass protects just to, to give yourself a couple of their seconds back there. But, you know, I think for the most of the season, I think there's time to correct. I think Bill's Twitter and the echo chamber that is kind of Bill's dialogue right now is kind of hurt by the fact that it's week one and not week seven. If, you know, we're going to that game and it's seven and two, when you get beat up a little bit, people are probably a little bit more calm. Understand because it's week one, we have no context. I, I think people are, are hitting that panic button and we want to get that offensive line fixed. I think there's probably solutions there, but I think anyone saying that the season's done or saying that there's some fatal, fatal flaw in this, team build that we have is is over exaggerating how about you kevin because you know you're talking to us how you know off air you've watched uh the bills for you know every game last five years so you've seen this team kind of at their best and their worst and i mean you saw them last year like what stuck out to you as far as something that was odd to you how much of a struggle it was for buffalo in certain aspects like what what to you was something that kind of caught your eye in this game i think you guys just came up flat like it's easy to forget that you guys really struggled badly on offense against Steelers in the first half last game. You made some great adjustments. Diggs went off and had a huge game and it kind of saved it. But this, it, 
it's kind of less the bills and like, keep in mind, the Steelers are going to be a top five defense. This is an elite defense. They don't have a good O line and their offense may struggle. And Ben, you know, has issues getting it ball down the field and that showed in a low scoring game, but like, I wouldn't get too down on this. Like it was just their day, you know, like, and I find that the fans, how do I want to put this without getting in trouble are maybe, Man, are you guys a little bit uh, used to Allen having 10 minutes to throw every play that now when he gets pressured every now and then we're going to kind of overblow this? I thought Allen had all day to throw on many, many throws. Like there were throws because I'm so jealous, right? Because Miami's Mm -hmm. offensive line is hot garbage. Like we say hot and there's five guys in the backfield. So like. I watch these plays where Allen's just bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing around. Oh, finally throws it. You know, there were some plays when the guy got in, but keep in mind, if you're going to throw the ball 90% of the time, you can't expect no pressures, especially against an elite defense. So I would just say to the Bills fans, maybe calm down a little. You guys are going to be fine. Instead of winning 14 games, you might win 13. You know, like you're still going to be a top three seed in the AFC easily. You're going to crush Miami this week and everything will be okay. But give the offensive line a little bit of credit. Everyone has trouble with JJ Watt or not JJ Watt, TJ Watt. You know what I mean? Everyone has trouble with Mm -hmm. Cam Hayward. Like, yeah, it's just a really good defense. No, I, I, I like a lot of the points you brought up and something that kind of came to me when you were, you know, we were talking, you know, you mentioned how Allen did have some times, uh, some plays in that game where he had ample time to throw the ball down the field. For me, something that was kind of surprising in this game, which is something I don't think is going to be a trend, but I don't think it's being talked enough about. It, it felt like that, and maybe this is more part to Pittsburgh's game plan and, and what they had in store for these Bills receivers, but it felt like they kind of struggled to get open. I mean, it felt like a lot of times Allen was trying to like kind of extend plays, was hesitating where to go with the ball, which is you know something mm-hmm. I don't think we were – accustomed to seeing it all last year where no one could really cover Stefan Diggs. No one could cover Cole Beasley. And they kind of had a, had a, had a wraps on them, had clamps on them. So I think that was something that maybe people aren't talking about enough, how, you know, these receivers, as much as we're looking at Allen, who, you know, he struggled, he didn't have his best game at all. The offensive line certainly had some problems on Sunday blocking that Pittsburgh front, but you know, the receivers struggled a little bit, get open and they dropped a couple balls that they usually catch. So, you know, there's definitely, I think, a lot to take away from this game and a lot of things that with this offense, I, I've i been a, someone who said, I don't think it's time to press the panic button. I don't think it's time to freak out. I do believe that this was just kind of a tough matchup week one because like you guys talked about, Steelers defense is top five in the league. That's a hard unit to start your season out against. So again, I, 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 I don't think it's panic time yet at all. I don't think, I don't see anything yet that, to me at least, and I could be wrong. I'm curious what you guys think, but I don't see anything yet that alarms me that there could be some trend of, of, you know, something worrisome going on here in Buffalo. I think all in all, it was just kind of a rough game where, like you said, Kevin, they just kind of came out flat. I feel like every year there's, uh, and pe- you can probably attest to this, Kevin, every, every time the Patriots had a Super Bowl run, it felt like there was a week where a bad Dolphins team would wreck them. And it was like a yearly thing where I felt like the, it was either the Dolphins team or some random team. Every year the Patriots made a run, They'd have a week where they just got their butts handed to them. And it was never week one because it always kind of came in the middle of the season. But, you know, that's the way football is sometimes. And, you know, they w- there was plays to be made, right? Josh Allen takes a little bit off that throw to Sanders in the first quarter. There's a, you know, there's a touchdown. Jaquan Johnson has slightly longer arms. Bills get a block punt. You know, a couple like, ex- you know, if Greg Weaver so is a little bit faster and they fall on that strip sack, maybe that's points right there, right? So, th- it's not like it was a blowout either. And I, you know, you take away that block pun and you know, you can always play the if and buts game. It, it was, it was a closer game than I think the box score really showed. Yeah. I think if he hits that, cause Sanders was wide open, that was brutal. If he hits that throw, I thought that that would have changed the whole complexion of the game. You would have went up a couple scores early. I think it would have changed how Pittsburgh had to play on offense a bit. And I think uh, that would have been a big thing. So that's not going to happen. You know, you're not, Allen's not going to miss wide open guys like that. Like he's not going to miss that throw. He definitely won't miss it next week with my luck. So uh, he'll hit them all. You know what I mean? So it'll be fine guys. Like 
uh, Sanders was still getting open. You were single Terry had was six and a half yards per carry. Like the, there were some really good things you did. You just ran into a good defense. And I thought your defense looks better this year than it did uh, as a whole last year. I know you guys ended up pretty hot the last few games, but uh, yeah, defense looks really good. I mean, you, you held them to what one touchdown can't, you can't ask more than that in the NFL, especially with the rules the way they are these days. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely agree with you, Kevin. I think the Bills defense, I mean, yes, this was a Steelers offense that is looks to be not on a great unit this year. Um, but they did did their, you know, they did their job. They only held them to, you know, they held them to one touchdown, were able to bend but not break and get them to kick a couple of field goals. So no defense, uh, they played a good one. Yeah, I mean, listen, this was a great Steelers defense. And and on top of that, I think that my biggest takeaway as far as kind of the offensive struggles, I mean, Ryan, you kind of mentioned it, was just, you know, Brian Dable didn't make adjustments, which is unusual for him. He proved to us all last year that he's, you know, very capable of making adjustments at halftime. He didn't for whatever reason this week. Um, but again, you know, for Bills fans who are, who are, who are saying fire Dable, bench Allen for Trubisky, oh, I've even heard some of that <laughs> nonsense going on. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. God. It's going to, it's getting rough, Kevin. Last year. Dable it's was getting so rough. good last year. I have never seen, not to take anything away from Allen or the receivers, but I have never seen that many wide receivers running wide open, like wide open in my eight since probably the 90s Dallas teams when the what's his name you guys would know the old offensive coordinator there uh I used to like uh, I can't North Turner when North Turner was in his prime mm-hmm. there's the last time I've seen so many wideouts last year running wide open Miami uh for instance used to do that covers cover zero blitzing all the time right it was giving other teams fits he threw in that little wrinkle where he had like uh, a receiver come in and just to pick up, just to chip that guy, that open guy, so that Allen has enough time to stand there and hit the little in and go to uh, to Brown for a touchdown in the week 17 there. Like, he was so good last year. I, I was shocked he didn't get a head coaching position and very disappointed that he didn't get a head coaching job. Um, I thought he for sure he was ending up in the Chargers. So fans that want to fire that guy, that is baffling to me because he was fantastic last year. He's one of the best seasons I've ever seen an offensive coordinator have. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, I think this is a lot of just this classic, and we see it every year in the NFL, this classic kind of week one overreaction to what happened. I mean, think about like, I I keep on reminding people this, like the Jaguars won a game week one last year. They, they beat the Colts week one. Everyone was thinking, you know, maybe this team isn't that bad. And then they lost the next 15 games straight and got the first overall pick. So like, you never know. Week one's always crazy. We see it every year. Give it till about week four. I think that's usually when you see teams sort of settle in and, and, and we kind of see what we expected to see or what we're going to see the rest of the year. So I, I don't think, that people should be making these crazy judgments quite yet. Like there's still some time to let this all kind of gel and settle down for every team, not just the bills speaking. This is about every single team in the national football league. So um, I, I think people are just getting a little too pissed off in a way over a win, because let's face it. I mean, this is unusual territory for the, for not just the bills, the bills fans having these sky high expectations and being that team that now that they have cemented themselves as one of the best teams in the league, Every team's going to give them their best shot every single week. It's a lot harder to be the hunted rather than be the hunter. So, uh, you know, th- this is going to happen from time to time, possibly. And I just think that, again, things will figure themselves out as the season kind of progresses. And, uh, you know, I-, I think part of it, too, just the discourse around it is people. It, it was the first st- full stadium game since COVID. I think people really, 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 really wanted to win and wanted to win big in that game. And, you know, we talked about it last week, Mitch and why we had maybe some apprehension about it. People making these like judge making all these super confident statements about it because, you know, I, I think Tomlin's almost like Belichick in the regard that regardless who you give him, he's going to put together a team that's going to challenge week in week out and it's going to be competitive. So, you know, it, it, like you said, I don't, not to beat the dead horse, but right onto the dolphins. Absolutely. And that's a perfect segue because, you know, let's talk about it. And the main reason why, you know, Kevin, we got you on because those Dolphins week two at Miami, one o'clock kickoff, uh, the first for the Bills, at least their first matchup, the division for the Dolphins, their second uh, consecutive game, in the division. 
I guess, Kevin, starting with you, like what, what did you see from this week one game with Miami? Like what stuck out to you as the most either important thing, concerning thing? Like what about this Dolphins team do you think you really took away from their week one win against the Patriots? Mm. Uh, defense looks very much like last year, which concerns me. Um, it looks like the kind of defense that is going to dominate uh, – immobile pocket passers and is going to get shredded by the guys like Allen. Um, I'm concerned. I love our, our, I love our secondary. Uh, we picked up, we replaced Bobby McCain with uh, McCourty who's holding it down for now um, until Javon Holland gets in there. Cause he's been, he's been our, our easily our best rookie. And that's saying something because Waddle had himself a game. Um, but McCourty played excellent. He was really good uh, last week. So I was excited about that. So the coverage is going to be good. They never even threw it, Xavier Howard. And he had to actually, like, he's the one that won the game, really, because he came in and punched the ball out late in the game. And he forced the fumble and recovered it to seal the victory. Um, but other than that, <clears throat> I like that. But my concern from last year is the same thing that gave the Bills trouble last week. Miami seems other than Emmanuel Ogba, no one can get any pressure unless they blitz. And if you blitz Allen and he just buys himself enough time, and I don't care how good your your corners are, he can't stay glued to guys like Stefan Diggs for, for too long. So uh, I'm not sure. I, I think I, met, I put in the group or I, I messaged someone basically saying like, can I be less confident after a win than I was, you know what I mean? Like going into it, like going into the season. Now the reverse is uh, Tua. A lot's going to be made about, I guess his quarterback rating wasn't great, but uh, he was uh, significantly more aggressive. So that was the big knock, right? He's checked down Charlie, checked down Charlie. He wasn't throwing it. So now, these stats were before the Monday night game, but heading into the Monday night game, he was the fourth most aggressive quarterback and had the fourth highest yards per attempt of everyone. So it's almost as if adding receivers with speed actually let him throw downfield as opposed to throwing to Matt Collins and, uh, you know, Lynn Bowden Jr. in the finals. Uh, so Parker was healthy and it showed. Uh, Jalen Waddle made a huge difference. We get Will Fuller back this week. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, but, and while he wasn't wildly successful, he ran one in and threw another one and then he threw a bad pick. Um, that was just dumb. I don't know. He said he was trying to throw it out of bounds and the guy picked it off on the sideline, but he got crushed. I will say that as he threw the ball, like I thought he was dead. Um, but I don't know, man, I, I don't get how Mac Jones can throw like nickel and dime and throw just three yard, three yard, three yards. Like all he did was throw, to uh to like the uh, what do you call it like the short hooks and uh his like running backs and stuff like that all game and they were saying like oh this guy's amazing but when Tua does it they hate it on it's a little <laughs> confusing but uh offensive line looks like garbage uh two is under pressure instantly all the time and he has to kind of avoid it um we have a hard time completing anything if it's not the first read because we have no time um so we'll see. Uh, Jackson was hurt, or he wasn't hurt. He had COVID, so he missed the whole week, so they didn't play him. So he wasn't there, so Liam Eikenberg had to get play uh, left tackle, for which is a position he hasn't played at all. So he played okay, considering. Um, yeah, the offensive line looks poor. Tua looks more aggressive. I like some of the play calls we have. Waddle looked really good. Um, in the defense – like I said, we'll be dominant in some games and we'll get eviscerated in others because the same weakness lies. So I want to sit on that defense for a second and just, you know, a couple questions, a couple observations I had watching game. Now, number one, I think a big, uh, something that's going to come into play here, because you talked about how much that defense is kind of predicated on the back end and, you know, hoping guys can get home and hoping you can rely on that, that, you know, those, those guys like Xavier Howard and Byron Jones being able to do their jobs long enough, but does losing a guy like Roquan Davis just got put on your starting nose tackle just got put on IR today. So how does that, what, I guess, what role did he have in this team? And is, is that going to be something that concerns you 
for this pass rush and their ability to stop the run going forward. Yeah, um, he was he's not like a great pass rusher, but again, that was his rookie year. But that we were really excited about him because he was dominating in camp. He played exceptionally well at the end of last year. He's a massive, massive man with long, long, long arms. Like he's just a huge guy. So it's definitely gonna matter. Um, in especially against the run. Like he was at the end of the t- year, he was e- eating up double teams and stuff like that. Like I was I was very hopeful that he was going to um, be the best player on that defensive line. Um, So it's kind of a blow. He's not out for the year, I don't think. I believe they put him on the IR with the designation to return after like three weeks. He can come back. But um, because he did, uh, he was on the field. Like he came off the field on his own power and he came back and he had his helmet on and he had a knee brace and everything. So while he will be out for the Bills game, I don't think he's out for the year. So I'm not sure we have to change plans. But for this week, it's going to make a huge difference because if we want to put guys, we're a little soft up the middle now. So that doesn't bode well. And I guess to to both of you, like looking at this game between Buffalo and, and Miami, like what do you think ends up being sort of the key matchup that this game potentially comes down to as far as, you know, Buffalo versus Miami, like positionally wise. For me, just watching that game and watching kind of what they wanted to do with Tua, and maybe you can correct me. It seems like they really want to get Tua to his first read. I want a lot of his good throws that he had in that game were kind of those quick slants where they got Parker out in space quickly. I think there was one in the second quarter that was a really good where he just kind of snapped, turned, hit Parker in stride, and he got. 15 yards had a similar had a couple similar plays with Waddle where it's just kind of first read snap and go. And so I think the Bills' ability to to kind of get pressure quickly will kind of be the catalyst for this game. Especially when I, I think it was the other McCourty brother who's on the Patriots. There was someone in that game that kind of reiterated it's that told me that you JC yeah. Jackson that had yeah. a comment in the game that their plan was in and I'm glad you said it, Kevin, that that their plan was after Tua gets to his first read, he's going to chuck it up and, and cause that's what they had seen on tape, at least up until this point. And there was another play in the game, I think in the uh, middle of the second quarter where they were, that they almost had another interception. Cause that's what happened where I think his first read was off. He was kind of falling back and he threw it and it was almost picked off by the other McCourty brother. Or it was almost picked off again and on a second or third down. So it, it that is that something you would agree with Kevin? Do you see another matchup that's, that that could change the course of the game yeah for sure if um like you said with the miami's offensive line being so inept if that first read's not open he's getting hit and when that happens all the time it it leads to bad habits like i don't care who the quarterback is like if you don't have time to throw you're not going to be any good you know and if we can't like hold up and pass protection then it's going to be a long day, you know? Now we, I, part of me dislikes this. Well, he always throws to his open guy if it's his first read. Well, that's the whole point. That's why you have a progression, right? You're supposed to throw to the first guy if he's open. Like, why would you not? I don't understand. So I just, I don't understand that as an, as a knock per se. Yeah. Or I understand what they mean when they say, you know, we got to get him through his progressions and then he'll start to panic. Well, usually he starts to panic because he's about to get killed. Um, so we'll see. So if they can actually give him some time, uh, it would be nice. And then we we'd be able to see. But like I said, it's hard to it's 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 hard to evaluate any quarterback when he doesn't have any time to throw. Yeah, I think I I definitely agree with you guys. I think that this Bills D line versus Miami offensive line is gonna be the key matchup in this one, at least as far as this Bills defense versus the Miami offense, just because like you mentioned, Kevin, I mean, Tua has shown in his career, like under pressure, he's not, you know, he's still, I guess you could say working on that. It still isn't maybe at the level that Dolphins fans would like it to be. And it doesn't help when you have an offensive line that that does have some of the struggles that Miami mm-hmm. does. Now, I will say, like, I still want to see some more out of the Buffalo defensive line. I know they did get some pressure on Big Ben. I thought, though, for how bad the Steelers offensive line was, I thought that it was going to be constant suffocating pressure really without blitzing. And it kind of wasn't that for Buffalo. 
And maybe just because they had a couple new faces and some guys have to play some bigger roles than what we saw from a year ago. But um, I, I do think that that matchup's really going to be the key in this one is can the Dolphins just give to a time? I think is what it comes down to. Well, and if you can, I think the one matchup that really favors Miami is Jalen Waddle. We've seen Buffalo struggle with speed and Jalen Waddle is on the Tyree kill tier of functional game speed and how fast he can play. And yes, he's a rookie, but he's a guy. If, if they can find ways to get to a time, maybe move the pocket you know, I don't know what kind of offense they're running with their new co-offensive coordinators, but if they, I saw a lot of kind of zone reads and RPOs. And so if they can, if they can manufacture time in the pocket, Jalen Waddle's a guy who I think could maybe have his, his come to the, you know, I know he had a good game last week, but you know, uh, a ride to the scene moment. If, if they can find ways to give him time, because we've seen Levi Wallace get burned by guys like Tyree Kill and guys with speed, and not just that, you know, it's you just the more weapons you have now. You know, I've always kind of liked Miami's weapons. De- Devontae Parker's a guy who's put up a lot of numbers before. Mike Kosicki's a guy who's gashed us for two straight years. It feels like so. Yeah, it's. I think the X factor here is if they can manufacture time, there are weapons and. I, I'm one of the things I'm tired of hearing from Bill's Twitter is that Tua doesn't have arm strength. Tua doesn't have arm strength, and I think we have these these glasses that oh, unless you have God God tier arm strength, that you can't be a quarterback in this league. And Tua's got perfectly functional arm strength. Is he going to throw the ball a mile? No, but he can do everything you need him to. He can throw a ball on the seam. He can he can throw a fastball. You know, he's got touch. So you know, I, I think if that rush doesn't get home and and Levi guy like a Levi Wallace is forced to be on an island that that's something that could that could kind of flip the script in this game yeah i can see uh i could see last game that two has got he's throwing the ball with more zip this year he's one more year removed from hip surgery so last year uh coming into the season he wasn't like working out he was rehabbing from like a catastrophic almost career ending hip injury it was, was a bad like, hip injury. Like people, yeah. said, people said he wasn't going to play last year. Yeah, he wasn't going to play. Exactly. So he got in. Uh, so, and then this year he was able to, like, he's bigger, he's stronger. He's got more zip on the ball. He's like, again, like you said, he's not, he's not Matthew Stafford or Josh Allen, but like he's, he's noticeably better than it was last year. Um, I'm still not sold that he's the answer, but we're 10 games in, right? It's hard to evaluate a guy in 10 games in. Um, so, we'll, you know, I'm not ready to give up on him yet. I like that he was more aggressive uh, last game. I like that I see a little bit more juice in his arm this year. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens when, if we go like 10 personnel, right? And we have uh, Fuller on one side who's lightning and has been a, made a career of being like a deep threat, a legitimate deep threat. And then last year actually became a legitimate number one receiver for Houston. People forget he was on pace for like 13, 1400 yards before he uh, got suspended. Uh, so if you have him on one side with his four, three, one, you got Waddle on the other side who runs, you know, like a four, two, nine kind of deal. Um, and then you got Gusecki and Parker working underneath. I like what I have. And then you've got, you know, Preston Williams and, and Albert Wilson coming off the bench. Uh, you know, you, you can throw some gimmick plays to Jakeem Grant because Jakeem Grant might be the fastest of them all. Not a great receiver, but like for the Isaiah McKenzie kind of gimmicky play. Um, and then the two running backs we have aren't really, I'm not great, huge on them as runners, but Gaskin and Ahmed uh, are good receivers. Um, so it's interesting. So it'll be, it'll be, he doesn't have to do the Josh Allen where you stand back there and, and break 50 tackles and then sling it 70 yards. He has to be more in the mold of a Matt Ryan or a Drew Brees. I know when I was talking with Knapp and Casey uh, a couple weeks ago, I said, I envisioned that if Tua hits his ceiling in my, in my eyes, it's Matt Ryan, like that kind of distributor, enough arm strength to get you there. I don't think he's ever going to be a top five guy but uh, good enough to win with. Ryan, I actually really like that you brought up Jalen Waddle, And I think that with Waddle too, I, it's not just him 
running deep. Like I feel like a lot of people think with the speed aspect against this Bills defense, it's going over the top. But what was one way that the Steelers ripped off a huge play, maybe their biggest gain of, of, of the day for them last week? It was on an end around a Claypool. And I could see Waddle being kind of in that same sort of role for them this year because, you know, like the Bills, I, I feel like throughout McDermott, this is, this is going to be kind of a weird criticism, and I don't know if this is so justified, but I, I kind of feel like throughout McDermott's time as head coach, the Bills have struggled with some misdirection on against their defense just because – specifically in the back end they don't really have the fastest you know guys back there and if the blocks are set up right i mean we saw clay i mean claypool was a block away from taking that thing into the house and that end around i mean michael hyde made a great tackle so you know jalen waddle using him in that aspect of the game which is what he was used a little bit at alabama though they would give him some of those sort of end arounds and screen passes just to get him out into space yeah. you know they, that could they, play they, a factor in this game yeah. for sure too they faked end arounds on several plays to him last game so you know they're going to give it to him at some point, but yeah, they they have they've uh, threatened them with that for sure. And you know, I, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, and I was going to say, you know, I, and then you know, not to get too far the, the down too far down the two a rabbit hole and this offensive rabbit hole. You know, this isn't the same offense as last year. You know, um, I would really recommend everyone go in and listen to or not listen read the uh, Robert Mays did a really good article on on. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick in the athletic and in it, it talked about the offense was centered around Ryan Fitzpatrick. And when they made the switch Tua didn't know the offense, cause it wasn't tailored to him. It wasn't his place. And that's why there was a lot of those struggles last year. And I, you know, just watching the game, it was such a different offense for Tua. You could tell this was an offense that was built around him and built to his strengths. And, and, you know, it, it really is, a new look offense. And I think, you know, and again, you know, I talked about with Mike Tomlin, I talked about Bill Belichick. Flores is a good coach. You know, we talk about coaches in this league who, who can coach above their talent. I really think Brian, Brian Flores is one of those guys who's, you know, another X factor in this game. You know, I, me and Mitch have talked about, you know, some of Mick McDermott's most impressive seasons, right. And even winning six games with that horrid 28 team was impressive. I think Flores winning five games with that, 2019 team dolphin team was super impressive so you know what what growth have you seen in brian flores this year so far as a coach that gives you encouragement for for his groups i think you know one of the things that i i've noticed in sean mcdermott i think you look at coaches who who get better and get over the top is the ability to, to adapt and get better year after year so do you see things in brian flores and things in this coaching staff that give you encouragement that things will continue to trend and build off the success they had last season? Mm, well, one of the things, it's not really new, but it, you can notice it now because it's become a, a pattern as opposed to a single data, data point, is that what I like about him and Chris Greer is that when they know something's not working, they, they rip the Band-Aid off, right? When they know something isn't going well, they don't try and force it because – that's the way they wanted to do things. So if something's not working or a player's not working, you know, we took a lot of heat for some of the free Asian guys that we signed and now they're, they're no longer here. Um, but some of these guys lost their jobs to, to younger guys that came out of nowhere. Like Shaq Lawson, for instance, lost his job to Andrew Van Ginkle and get Van Ginkle just outplayed him. So we didn't sit there and say like, you know, we're going to keep playing this guy because we paid him $10 million a year. We, Okay, he's out of the lineup. We put the best guy in, and you know uh, we traded Lawson off in the in the off season. So I like that. I mean, it was you can say in hindsight maybe it wasn't a great signing, but when they signed him, they knew what they were getting. They just didn't realize what they had in a fifth round draft pick who didn't play that much in Wisconsin, right? So it it's very cliche in football to say we're going to play the best players because we all know that doesn't happen. It does in Miami. And I like that. I like that a lot because he's not afraid at any point to pull a guy if he's not working and put it in. He's He, he is focused on winning every game and he, he's going to do whatever he can that game to win. Um, and again, while cliche, it's kind of rare. So well, I do I do like that. Well, it's some cost fallacy. You know, it's something that I think even McDermott and being at times struggle with, with, you know, keeping in guys like Brian winners and sometimes keeping 
player. And I think Mitch, you even talked about it in one of your, uh, you just talked about it with Rico. You talked about one of your like five minutes with Mitch things that sometimes the bills even get a little bit into that sunk cost fallacy that just because you spent that money on someone that Trent you have Murphy. to yeah. Yeah, Trent Murphy. Well, yeah, Trent that, Murphy. That, that, that's an exactly right. perfect. That, that's perfect. Josh Norman. That, right. Josh Norman, you know, even you could say, you know, maybe to a lesser extent, guys like Levi Wallace and, and stuff like that, that, you know, the bills sometimes settle with players that are okay at certain positions like Levi Wallace. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's a really good point. I like the the Dolphins Bills comparison. You know what I mean? Like it's you guys are a much better team than we are right now. You're a different spot in your life cycle. But I like that the they both have a coach and GM that seem to work well in tandem. You know, and for all of um, Chris Greer's like misses, if you will, when you have a roster that is bereft as talent is the 2019 Dolphins. You got a ton of money. You're going to spend it. You're never going to bat a thousand, right? Um, no one, you know, talks about like some of the late round guys or some of the the guys that came out of nowhere to play with like the Zach Sealers that, you know, Nick Needham's and these guys that were undrafted or free agents or, you know, uh, waiver wire pickups that all of a sudden have developed into like really good plus starters for Miami. Um, for all his misses, two years ago, this was a team that they said was the worst roster in all of football. And they're coming off a season where they won 10 games. So what I like about that is a lot of that sim- it is the same as with the Bills, right? You guys had a what was a pretty brutal roster his first you – no, know, the first year you went to the playoffs, right, at 9-7? and seven? Yeah, but yeah. That, that roster was not good either. I mean, it was it really two years good. of yeah. roster rebuilding. And then it- you tore it down a bit with Allen. Um, so I like that. And the funny thing is, is that um, – not to get into trouble with Bills fans, but I would say Bean's Achilles heel – has been so far in his tenure is the defensive line. He's a really hard time. Like you guys had a lot of misses on that defensive yep. line, like Jefferson, <laughs> Butler, you know, Addison really didn't give you what you thought you were getting, like like Trent Murphy, like a lot of swings and misses. And he's been outstanding elsewhere. And I would say Greer's Achilles heel is the offensive line. And we've sunk so many assets into that and draft picks and everything. And you know, it's almost like whichever one gets it right first, you know. Um, but I find it interesting that uh, they both have these coach GM combos that are really in sync and and uh, and they've there's some similarities and some parallels there. Defensive coaches, things like that. Yeah, I've been I've been saying it for the last two years. I, I think that Miami is like a step behind Buffalo as far as like you said, kind of where they are in this roster rebuild, but no, I think and I think Brian Flores brings a lot of the same things to the table that Sean McDermott does. He's clearly a great leader. The players respond to him in such a positive way. Um, he demands just hard work, tough football. You know, work your you know work your ass off. On, you know, in practice to win games on Sundays. So no, I've always thought that B- Buffalo and Miami have kind of shaped themselves very similar to one another, and they're just at kind of different points in their roster rebuilds. Now I have. One more question before we kind of get into what this game might look like specifically, but you know, this Patriot, I mean, the Patriots, the Dolphins, I think had what a lot of people considered one of the steals of the draft in Jalen Phillips in the, you know, in the, in the later bits of the first round here, a guy who uh, was at Miami, just like Gregory Rousseau kind of came in and took Rousseau's job when he went out on, when he decided to sit out last year and a guy that we know came in with red flags, but had monster, monster, monster production in training camp. And I think are in duty in, in Miami and a guy that, you know, I think has really high expectations and bills fans thought about, you know, when we talked about, would we trade up a guy that a lot of bills fans would have thought about trading up for? What does he look like? I know I was looking at the, the depth chart. It looks like he's third on the depth chart listed at linebacker right now. So what, kind of production are you guys looking for from him how has he looked for the team so far i'm just really curious just kind of the circle back the stuff that we talked about with the draft with him yeah he's playing like the you know quote linebacker but it's more like you would see like almost a traditional three four outside linebacker like we're not dropping him into coverage you know what i mean like when he comes in um he's third they they list him on the depth chart as third string but i'd be curious to see how many snaps he played last game because i think he played on the almost every third down 
So right now they're kind of bringing them in slowly, um, using them in obvious posture situations. I wasn't blown away, we'll say, last uh, last game. But then again, um, Isaiah Wynn's a really good offensive tackle. Um, and uh, That whole line is good. Yeah, that's, that's yep. a really good offensive line. So we'll see. Um, it'll be interesting to see how he can, does against the Bills. Um, hopefully he gets better uh, as we go through because, again, I wasn't, like, blown away. You can see the obvious burst. You can see the speed. Um, <clears throat> right now it just looks like he doesn't have a plan, you know, if that makes sense. Like, it doesn't look like he he's just trying to out-athlete athlete everyone, and that's not going to work. Um, plus he's probably never played against anyone as big as Orlando Brown before. So, um, or it's not Orlando Brown, it's what Trent Brown. Yeah. Um, so we'll see, like he was okay. Um, but, and it's hard to expect too much of a rookie pass rusher, but he's the key, right? Because he's the guy that, um, last year in Miami, if it wasn't Ogba, there was no one else getting consistent pressure without the blitz. You know, Van Ginkle showed a bit of juice, but he's a little small to hold up like, uh, you know, as your DE kind of thing. So um, this is the guy, right? This is the guy we need, especially against Buffalo, because you have to get pressure on Allen. You have to have an athlete that can, you know, at least attempt to track him down and have the speed to stay with him. They're pretty close. I think they're because pretty close in their 40 times, I think, like, their their speeds are comparable um so if he can be that like dynamic pass rusher it's going to make a massive massive difference for us um so we'll see uh it's a lot to ask this game maybe he'll show up a bit more in halloween in the game too but we'll see yeah absolutely for sure i mean it's I'm definitely curious to see how he plays because he was a guy I know that Bills Mafia really crushed over in the draft and we we're really hoping that he would somehow fall to them at 30, but uh Miami scooped him up. I guess guys, you know, kind of looking at this this game, I mean, um, unless Ryan, unless there's any other uh questions you you want to ask Kevin, uh, but we could get right into some score predictions and what we think could happen in this game. Uh, I just want to add one more point. I think one more potential game wrecker. Is also, you know, we talked about some of the issues on the Dolphins line, but I mean, Christian Wilkins, I think, is a guy that that can produce well, who who's playing end for them now, and and you know, is he a guy who's, you know, I I feel like he was taken a couple spots above Oliver in the same draft, I think, right? Or my, do I have that right? Or maybe it was yeah, the year I after think Oliver? Right, right. No, it was or was it the year after draft. Oliver? Same, same draft. draft. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Thirteenth yep. pick. Yeah. Um, I'll always remember him as the guy who did the splits after Clemson won the national championship. Yeah. Um. Is, how is he coming along? How how is he is he is he developing? Because I know you know you draft guys there and, and you want to see real game wrecking talent. Is he the guy who's developed the, the way you want to see develop? I'd like to see a bit more splash splash plays. It's a lot like I would say at Oliver. You know, you can see the the plays at times where he has like a a flash of a dominant play. Um, he's played well against the run. We list him as a DE, but he. We play a lot of bare fronts, so he's he's playing heads up over a guard, so or maybe even some four eye just over the guard. You know what I mean? Like he's yeah. not he's not out out wide, so he's basically a D tackle, yeah. just the way our defense is. So he's been <clears throat> generally he's been good. Um, he didn't play that great last week. He was he he matched up against Shaq Mason and uh, the uh, Michigan kid that uh, they got Michael Old Nuenu or whatever. And David Andrews was tough, but I guess that's a tough, that's probably the best interior trio in the league. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see. It'll be interesting. He, I need him to step up, right? Uh, a guy that a lot of guys don't know about is Zach Sealer, who played really well for us last year. Um, he's plays a similar, he's like your big three, four end, you know, five technique, four eye, that sort of thing. I need him. Uh, we need some more pass rush. But yeah, Christian Wilkins, he's played, he's played well. I would like to see more out of a first round pick, um, especially since I was a huge uh, Simmons fan in that draft. And uh, and he's looking pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <sighs> well, that being said, guys, uh, let, let's just get right into score predictions. I'll start with you, Kevin. Uh, 
prediction for this game and what, and what do you see? How do you see it kind of breaking down on Sunday? Uh, Bills 42 13. Oh my um, God. Yeah, wow, Kevin, be... not, not coming <laughs> your own team. Like, my... oh, it's going to be a slaughter. So, um, Miami built their team to beat the Patriots. So for years they drafted, and other than this year, like the whole team was was built to beat the Patriots. And then all of a sudden one day Tom Brady was gone. And now we have this mobile quarterback who can throw the ball from anywhere. Uh, and that's not what we're designed to beat. We're designed to overwhelm guys in the pocket and have a secondary that that is sticky man coverage because they only have to cover for a few seconds. But if you can break containment, which Allen always does, this is why Allen always does well against us. If you can break containment, if you can buy some time, it doesn't matter how good your secondary is, you're going to get – your guys are going to get open, especially when you have a wide receiver core like you guys do. Um, on offense, a lot of our, our thing this year is we added a lot of speed, right? And the, the premise is supposed to be that – uh, two is more of like a blackjack dealer, like just get it out to the playmakers and let them do their thing. Uh, while I think that, that, you know, if we have Fuller and all those guys and, and two, gets a little bit more season. I think that'll work really well against teams like new England and Baltimore and the man heavy teams. Um, your team is this, you know, cover three, uh, play way back, let everyone rally up and uh and and then tackle right have them catch the ball in front of you and then take them down and that's kind of it plays away from our strengths because um we're looking for explosive plays and your defense is literally designed to suppress explosive plays the only way i can see us really making a game of it is um as i said with these two fast guys if you guys have to get poyer out of the box Cause I don't care. I know Tua and like you said, the fans are really on him for his arm and stuff like that. He's still an NFL quarterback. Yeah. And if you play man on man with Fuller Parker and Waddle, one of these guys is going to get open deep. So you, if they can force uh Poyer to get him out of the box and they can generate a bit of a run game, that's, that's like their, that's their path to victory or at least their path to stay in the game. Unfortunately, I think your scheme is too, it's going to require too many drives that were like 12, 13 play drives. And eventually a quarterback with less than 16 games experience is just going to screw up because he hasn't seen it enough. He hasn't, you know, played enough of those situations and he's playing with, and again, while it's nice to have these wide receivers, he's never played a game with a guy like Will Fuller. So he still kind of get to know them. So, um, and I don't think their offensive line can, can open any holes really in, so unfortunately, I think that's why uh, you guys are going to crush us. Plus, you're pissed off. <laughs> you played flat last week. You didn't play well. Uh, Allen didn't play well, and he's way better than that. And he always kicks our ass. So I'm sure it's all signs point to a bad Sunday for me next week. <laughs> How about you, Ryan? So it's funny because I have more confidence in Kevin's team than he does. I think. I, I think <laughs> the Bills still come out. You know, but I, you know, I believe that things like the Patriots beating the Bills a million times in a row is, isn't something that's it is a high in probability. So I think the idea that, you know, the Bills have won seven of eight games against the Dolphins, just the way football is, you know, th there's always the chance that, you know, eventually the Dolphins are going to win one. Eventually Flores is going to figure it out against this team, right? You know, is it this week? I don't think so. But, you know, I, I think Flores is a guy who's incredibly smart, who knows what he's doing, and at some point will figure out a way to not stop Josh Allen, but to make Josh Allen's life harder and get games into a situation where one bounce, one tip ball can change the course of a game. You know, I think this game... You know, I don't think it's going to be a coming out game for anybody. Like, I don't think two is all of a sudden going to have this, you know, come to Jesus game. But I think maybe it's a game that's a little bit closer than Bills fans are comfortable with. You know, I, I'm predicting, um, I think Bills probably win, I'm going to say 24 or 27 17. 
you know, Dolphins keep a, you know, I think Dolphins maybe play a little bit better defense and, you know, get a late score. Bills have to go down, kick a, kick a field goal late to, to put it away type of thing. So for this game, I, I, I think we're going to see um, not maybe an exactly similar game, but something kind of like what we saw last year in Miami week two, where I actually think the Dolphins are going to have some success offensively. I think that they do have the skill position guys to make some big plays to put up some points. Um, I do agree with you, Kevin, though. I, I do think the Dolphins defensive, like, you know, they're how they have their defense set up and their, their scheme does kind of favor Josh Allen, allowing him a lot of man to man with single high safety, which, you know, has always kind of been his bread and butter. Uh, I, but I, like I said, though, I do think Miami's going to play a tough one. Cause listen, the dolphins, like, I feel like you guys are always tough. You're always a very physical team. Uh, so I have Buffalo winning uh 31 20 as my final score, but I do think it's, it's a, it's a closer game than what maybe the score appears. I, I, I think Miami keeps it within a score. Or so throughout the entire game. And maybe that's just the Bills PTSD in us. We're we're children. Of maybe, the maybe, yeah, right, right. I mean, me and Ryan were not overly confident last week, and I don't know if I can ever be overly confident after that. But, uh, but yeah. So that about does it here for the five A five report, uh, Kevin. Before we kind of sign off, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, like the stage is yours. So anything you want our vis- our listeners to know about, or anything you got going on? Plug your birthday. It's your birthday. Happy birthday, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. It on Tuesday. Nice. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Today. Well, thanks, guys. Right. Yeah. No, uh, I'm just like some dude that all of a sudden Pierre just keeps putting in these different group chats. It's real weird. I uh, I sat beside Rico on a bus to uh, Costa Rica, and next thing I know, five years later, uh, I'm in all these group chats, and uh, I get to talk football with you guys. So um, I don't really have anything to plug. The uh, name you see beneath there, at Kevin Gerard 13 is my Twitter. If you want to throw me a follow, we can uh, – argue uh i spend a lot of time you know arguing with bills fans so and my food takes yes yeah (laughs) horrific that's really that's really the biggest argument right there of anything for sure my goodness and i i I gotta i gotta hear him nonstop, kevin i mean i I hear him every week yeah when we're done here i'm gonna go eat some peanut butter cups so (laughs) um uh so, uh, yeah, that about does it here for the 5v5 report. Uh, we thank you so much for listening and your continued support. Again, our time has changed. We're Wednesdays at noon. I'll, I'll, I'll keep on reminding everyone until we're kind of getting to the swing of things here, but Wednesday at noon is when our podcast is dropping now that it's the regular season. Uh, please follow everyone at BF and, and check out all the great work that's on YouTube, uh, on whatever your podcast from, uh, on, the, on the blog. A lot of people work really hard there. So uh, we appreciate all your support. Uh, And with that being said, for Ryan Sullivan and Kevin Gerard, I'm Mitch Brewer. Thanks for listening and have a great rest of your day.